Uh, hi, Eric. Hello. How you doing? Fine, and you? Uh, good enough, good enough. Um, my, my, my dogs are being very loud today and may, may interrupt the broadcast, but, uh, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll stay under control. The dogs of, of dialoguing. Uh, yes. I don't exactly. think you should bother exactly. copywriting that. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, uh, probably not, probably not. Um, so, you know, over, over the, the, the past two days, uh, for, for the first time, we've seen a, a couple of news organizations, a, ABC News and uh, the New York Times, say that they're going to start referring to the uh, situation in Iraq as, as a civil war. Um, meanwhile, the, the, the Washington Post, Lynn, Lynn Downey was quoting editor and publisher, saying that uh, they, they weren't going to follow suit, uh, essentially because... Um, that's not what the American or Iraqi governments want to call it, and so they feel compelled to to follow along with that with that dictate, which, which seems a little crappy to me. Yeah, I was going to do a, my column uh, on um, on this topic for the Center for American Progress this week, my Think Again column. So I've collected all the data. I haven't read it all yet, but it, you know, the Washington Post, the Washington Post is a part of the United States government. Okay. It is. Uh, they don't, I mean, if the United States government takes a certain line on something, the Washington Post feels like it has to take that same line unless uh, it's, you know, unless there's a very good reason it shouldn't. Unless there's some uh -huh. incident that gives them permission not to do it. Now, uh, I wrote a Nation column this week about Rummy's lie, Bush's lie about Rummy. And, mm -hmm. and, and in this case, it was, it was, um, Unique because Bush lied, which is not unique, of course. But he said, when I asked him, "Didn't you lie?" He said, "Yeah, I lied." What are you going to do about it? You know? Right. Sure. Well, and, he actually, I mean, he got, he got a different question, and he he was explaining himself by saying he lied. Yeah. Uh, he right. said the only way I could get you to stop asking me that question was to give you that answer, which was clearly false, and he was admitting that it was false. So that created a kind of existential crisis for the. Uh, the mainstream media or the White House press corps, because sure. if the president says he's lying, what are you doing there reporting down his words and giving them to the public? So, right. um, and also, if you say you're a liar, that makes you a liar next time as well as this time. Now, the only way right. for them to deal with that is just to ignore it. So, mm -hmm. so naturally, if the government, I mean, at this point, after everything we've been through, and I could take up all the rest of our time talking about absolutely everything this government has said about Iraq that has turned out not to be the case. Some of it was lies, some of it was wishful thinking, some of it they might have believed, some of it they might have had evidence that turned out to be false, very little of sure. that. Um, but the fact that the Bush administration or the Iraqi government, which is also an appendage of the Bush administration, says that something is not the case, and the Washington Post takes that seriously, I find that comical at this point. I thought, I thought, I mean, right, who, sure. who has less credibility about Iraq than any other human being on the planet? Well, George Bush. Right. No. I mean, you, you, you even had uh, D D Dana Priest, who's of course a writer for the Washington Post. You know, on television, she was saying something like, "Well, you know, the level of violence certainly qualifies it as a civil war, but still, for some reason, that's that's not going to go in in her article." I think civil um, war is kind of mild for the level of violence. I think apocalypse is the better. Sure. No, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I remember back two years ago, I guess, 2004, when you first started hearing that, that, that Iraq, you know, might become a civil war, yeah. that the developing situation could be a civil war, that it might break out. And, you know, I mean, it, it just seemed clear that this is what had been going on for, for, for a very long time. I mean, as soon as we... Um, you know, organized a, a, a government in Iraq, and there was fighting between that government and other people in Iraq. Um, you know, that that is a, a civil war. Um, well, no, I mean, there, I are, you know, there are rebellions in places that do not deserve the, the quality, of the, that have not reached the level of civil war, you know. I don't know if, I don't know if Moscow was in a civil war with Chechnya, you know. They're, 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 they want to leave. Maybe the Chechnyans feel like they're in a civil war, but I don't think the Russians do. Um, well, but this was this, that that was America's civil war, right? Was part of the country wants to secede. Yeah, no, but that 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 took up all of the energies of the country. That was a real civil war that cut the country right down in half. Okay, I see. so you're saying if, it, if it's saying small it's, enough, yeah, you can you can contain rebellions like there was Shays' Rebellion 
against George Washington. Uh -huh. That was not a civil war. Um, right. But okay. the point is, is that uh, the situation, you know, it's, it's kind of almost silly. I mean, the situation in Iraq is so horrific, and there's so much violence. It's so unsafe. There's so little civil order that what you call it is really besides the point. The point, a bigger point, is what to do about it. But the Bush, Bush administration has absolutely no idea what to do about it. And so they want to fight over what you call it. And, and you know, for the Washington Post to, to say, I mean, I don't mind. That is a noisy vote. I don't, I don't mind the Washington Post saying we're not going to call it a civil war because here are the reasons we think it's not a civil war. But to say that we're not calling it a civil war because the Bush administration is not calling it a civil war, that, that's, that's this pure and simple abdication of the responsibility of the journalists. Then you become just a propaganda flack. Now, if that's what they said, I don't have the quote in front of me. If you say that's what they said, I just think that's... Well, it was, I, 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 I think what they said was that it was the Iraqi government. But, I, I mean, you know, what's, what's the difference? I agree. The Iraqi government just says what the Bush administration tells it to say. They're, they're right. I mean, certainly Bush. what they say in English to the English language press is, you know... Um, <clears throat> It's kind of like I mean, that, I guess, that famous I, 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 Magritte painting, you know, Sine Paz and Peep. Uh, right, exactly. Um, you know, uh, well, I mean, speaking of credibility, uh, you, you had a, a, a couple posts up uh, recently on your blog, um, sort of touring back at uh, Bill Crystal quotations of your, um, yeah. and, 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 and so on and so forth. And, I mean, I know something that... <coughs> You know, definitely seems uh, uh, aggravating to to a lot of people is the extent to which um, you know there's really no been no uh, accountability whatsoever for um, pundits and and columnists and and things they said uh, about this war before it happened and and things they've said o over the years. I mean, y you can notice. You know, as, as, as the war goes on, the more sort of hawkish people, it, it seems, will just almost sort of be six or nine months behind the curve in, in whatever they say. And, 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 you know, will wind up saying things that more pessimistic people were saying just a little while back, but never with any, you know, um, concession, like maybe I've been consistently over-optimistic about this from the beginning, and you should stop asking me what to think. Right. There was those, those very funny conversations. They're, I mean, they're sad and funny at the same time of, of years ago where you would try to get them to admit that there are no WMDs there. And they would say, what does it matter whether or not there are WMDs there? Look at the situation. We have to deal with it. Or they would say, what does it matter whether or not there was any out relationship between Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein? Certainly you could admit that Al-Qaeda is there now as if the cause of Al-Qaeda being now there weren't the fact that they get, put us on this screwy policy in the first place. Look, you know, I think this, to me, what's most interesting about this is there's been a total and complete failure of the political establishment to hold, uh, to hold anyone to any accountability. And what we were just talking about with the Washington Post is an example of that failure. Because the, the people who we're talking about, the Bill Crystals, the Richard Pearls, the, 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 the neoconservative supporters in the media of this uh, invasion, they're not about intellectual honesty. That's not their job. Their job is to be on their side, you know? Their job is to say whatever helps their team. Liberal journalists are journalists. Conservative journalists are conservatives. By, and large. By the way, that's a quote from Grover Norquist. Um, okay. Now, now... Well, if Grover says it. Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I had a talk with a friend of mine who's the editor of a pretty prominent op-ed page a couple weeks ago. And I mm -hmm. said... You know, one of your recent hires doesn't strike me as uh, entirely an intellectually honest human being. And he said, or he or she said, you know, I wouldn't entirely disagree with that, but he or she does represent that point of view pretty well. Uh -huh. In other words, the, the right has been so uh, effective at working the refs in the media that the media feel like they have to have this side represented. And in fact, in, in the opinion media, it's dominant. And the question of whether or not it's true or intellectually honest never gets asked. Never gets asked. It doesn't matter. It's besides the point. You can say anything on any one of these shows, and it, there's, there's, there's no... If someone points out to you a day later that what you said was completely false, it, it's not like you have anything to be ashamed of. Because it's not right. about, Although, you it's know, not I mean, about being accurate. I'll just finish this one sentence. It's not about being uh, accurate. It's about how well you represent your side. 
Right. I mean, I guess I, the only d- d- distinction I would make is that, you know, with some of these guys, it seems to be all about, um, you know, about about their team and that, you know, they'll say sort of whatever, you, you know, the line of the day is. Whereas, whereas other people, I, I mean, the, 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 the biggest proponents of, of this war in, in the press, right, the, the Bill Crystals, Charles Krauthammers, those guys, I mean, they, um, I, I think, are, are wrong, have been consistently wrong about, about just about everything, but at the same time are, are, are really true believers in a, a kind of, you know, a policy of endless wars, um, especially in the Middle East. Yeah, they're Leninists, they're Leninists. But why does the Washington Post, and why does CNN, and why do you know, MSNBC and why did Meet the Press, why are they employing Leninists who have an unbroken record of being wrong about everything? Why, as, as I said in the, in the post, Rumsfeld and Fife and Wolfowitz are all gone now. Why are all of the people who, have, who made the exact same arguments in their columns in these newspapers as respected and admired as ever? Right. Uh, well, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's a it's 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 a good question. Well, what's your uh, what's your thought on it, young man? Well, as to as to why they are, uh, you know, I mean, because well, I mean, I, I, I think you know, as 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 you say, there's no, I don't know what the mechanism of accountability in in something like punditry is supposed to be. I mean, what would it? I I, I would have a hard time imagining anyone deciding at the margin, you know, whether or not they're going to buy the Washington Post is based on whether or not Charles Krauthammer's column appears in it, right? So that there's no, there's no, you know, I mean, I mean, Rumsfeld gets fired because at some point he becomes politically embarrassing to to, to Republicans and and they're afraid of losing elections, you know, they're afraid of losing something unless they on some level try to make a show of accountability, so on and so forth. And it it doesn't seem to me that the kind of major, uh, you know, media outlets face that sort of structure, especially with, with the columnists they hire. And instead what you get is the question of, you know, how, how, how attacked are you going to be, you know, as, as part of the, the, the liberal media, quote unquote. Um, you, you know, and so there's this felt need to put people up there who are going to be, you know, representatives of, of the right, some kind of strategy of appeasement. Um, you know, then conversely, obviously, you have, you have lots of people who are on Fox News and there's no accountability there just because in a straightforward sense, you, you know, the yeah. ownership doesn't give well, a Well, I think it's, uh, as I think about it, you know, I was a pundit on television when MSNBC began for two years, and I used to get in mm-hmm. trouble a lot. And whenever I would get in trouble, it was because I wasn't playing by the rules. There, you know, you, mm-hmm. can, you can say a lot of things, you can say outrageous things about some things, and you can't say anything that's out of the ordinary about other things. And I mm-hmm. think that, you know, take a look at how Robert Novak lost his job at CNN. You know, he said, he said bullshit on the air, and he walked off. And they said, right. okay, that's against the rules. You can't do that. But what Robert Novak did in the case of the Wilson case was far worse in terms of what he wrote in the Washington Post. And that didn't mm-hmm. even raise an eyebrow. They didn't even notice that they had any problem, you know, until, mm-hmm. until the CIA objected. So the fact is, is that Robert, Robert Novak knows how to play his role, and Bill Crystal and Charles Carthammer know how to play their roles, and the few liberal columnists that are in the mainstream media know how to play their roles. And as long as everybody's playing their role, and, 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 it's, and I mean that in a, in a literal sense, as if they were actors on a stage, then there's no problem. But it, sure. it doesn't. The actual content of what they say is irrelevant. It's like it's kind of it's kind of pathetic to take it seriously. No, I mean I I, I think that's right. I, I mean I guess you know one word of uh, caution. I, I I guess I will have about uh, <coughs> the idea of uh, you know holding holding people accountable is that um, you, you know I <laughs> I actually wouldn't particularly want to be held accountable for for some of the things uh, I, I myself thought. Um, before this war started, um, you know, I, I, oh, I so you're starting in that. You're starting the. Uh, you're starting in the club now. Have I asked everyone to please come forth and explain how it is that they made the mis- this mistake? And since it was, it has turned out to be such an enormous mistake. What have they learned so that we can now trust their judgment? And you're going to be the first volunteer. Go ahead. Take your time. Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 I've learned many things. Um, but, but you know, I mean, I think what, what, one thing I, I do want to say that connects to the the accountability point is that, yeah, you know, at, at the time this all started, I was a a, a college student. Um, you know, and a 
observer of politics, I guess. You know, I, I, I read stuff. And, and a big part of my thinking was that I saw all of these um, Democratic Party politicians supporting the war. You know, Dick Gephardt was the Democratic leader in, in the House. Uh, Tom Daschle was the leader in the Senate. Joe Biden ch- chaired the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Jane Harman was the ranking member on House Intelligence. Tom Lantos on House International Relations. Ike Skelton on House Armed Services. These guys, they were all supporting the war. My thought, which, which I thought was a... At the time, I was very impressed with, with the sophistication of my view, as opposed to these kind of lefty college student types, was that, you know, you wouldn't have all these people from the opposition party agreeing to go along with this unless they, too, who could also presumably see this this evidence, this intelligence, whatever... Um, you know, thought it was a good idea, and that therefore this administration, who I distrusted, I, I could in fact trust because uh, because the other side, by and large, um, was was with it too. Um, I, I think that's an entirely... in retrospect that line of thought was a little mistaken. Yeah, I think that's an entirely forgivable line of reasoning for a young person who's just entering into this world until you see just how corrupt the thought process is at the center and how people in the system aren't really responding to actual arguments. They're responding to what they understand to be their own political and material interest. I remember when I was a young man, uh, I was just starting to write out. I was actually writing a lot for the New Republic in those days. And um, mm-hmm. the New Republic editor, Mort Kondraki, uh, mm-hmm. at the time, uh, wrote a piece about the importance of burden sharing. And he, and he had... And he, and he, he, took all these names and he said, you know, if Ronald Reagan, Casper Weinberger, and then he had a bunch of Democrats all agree on an idea, and he wrote it straight, being more Kondraki, he wrote, you can bet it's an idea whose time has come. And then I, and I took all those names and wrote a piece that began, if so-and-so agree, uh, all agree, or you can bet it's an idea, and I wrote dot, 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 like the Vietnam War. <laughs> in other words, Vietnam is what cured me, even though it was happening when I was in my teens. Uh, I was I, I I sort of grew up with it surrounding me and the horror and how it destroyed so much of the country and yet every all of these smart guys all thought it was such a great idea. Vietnam cured me of listening to these guys without of hearing these guys without listening to what they were actually saying. And so I don't trust the damn thing that it really anyone says except people with extremely long track records that I've followed over the years. And then I sure. and then I still have you know I try and make up my own mind, but I do think what you're saying is what most people do. They just I mean they don't have time to follow politics all day. They don't they don't know whether or not there's WMD. They don't know whether or not Iraq has any connection to Al Qaeda. That's why Bush was so effective at being able to convince people that Iraq was responsible for 9-11 without even saying so. Bush never actually No, made sure, it. sure. I mean, you, you, you sort of imply it, and, you know, people, people, people don't look, look this stuff up. Right, and, but, they, you know, this and is they why. would say, you know, why would all these people be saying it if it weren't true? Well, in fact, they have good reasons for saying it, even though it's not true, which is, in Bush's case, it's the fact that he and Cheney and Wolfowitz uh, had decided to invade Iraq probably, you know, before they were ever in office. That if they ever got the chance right. again, they were going to go get, go after Saddam Hussein. They were just pissed off about not having been able to do it before. And yet the political system just doesn't reflect that. You can read it. Nick Lemon actually wrote in, uh, in the in, when he was writing about Bush's inauguration, he wrote, mm-hmm. these people are going to invade Iraq. You know, He could see that, uh-huh. that was that was one thing that they were all looking for. It would have happened with or without 9-11 in the case of Iraq. But... Lemon can write that, and reporters can read it, and they can say, yeah, that makes sense, and then they'll forget it the next day. Because the next day is all about the surface. And, and, right. and that's another reason, I think, that go back to our earlier question, as to why these guys have no accountability. Because the only, the only questions they ever ask is, is this true on the surface? Are we, is this something that will embarrass us tomorrow? And, and there's no place in the system, you know, it's something I've been concerned about for a long time, there's no place in the system for people with actual knowledge of things, you know, who have an understanding of the economics or the history or the sociology of the region, to actually be heard and be taken seriously. Because they don't, they don't speak in this crazy soundbite television-driven language we have. 
Yeah, yeah no, you know, I, I just, I, I guess, I, I've been wanting to say, as this sort of, you know, debate's been, been raging, I don't know if raging is the right word, there's been controversy about Nancy Pelosi's uh, apparent desire to uh, move um, uh, uh, Jane Harmon a- out of the... Uh, top-ranking spot on, on the Intelligence Committee. Uh, you know, this is, in, in what I've read, almost uniformly been portrayed as just a kind of personal vendetta of, of, of Pelosi's um, against Harmon. And, you know, I mean, for all I know, that's, that's perfectly true. Uh, you know, but from where I sit, I'm, I'm interested to know, I mean, well, why is it that, that Jane Harmon, who was there on the Intelligence Committee, was the top Democrat on the committee, um, what what was she doing during the years 2001, 2002, that, you know, led her to agree that, that Iraq had active nuclear programs and a growing al-Qaeda presence and that she should vote to, to authorize war? Um, you, you know, because, um, I, I mean, obviously there, there, there were lots of pro-war Democrats. And, you know, Kev, Kevin Drum did, did a blog post sort of suggesting that, that people raising this issue were... Uh, you know, aiming for an unrealistic total purge of, of every Democrat who, who voted for the war, which, which obviously you can't do just because there's so many of them. But I, I, it does seem to me that it's, it's fair to say that there's a, a, a special responsibility for a politician who, you know, believes she's entitled to be in charge of the Intelligence Committee to, you know, like have some clue about, about intelligence questions when, when they come up. Yeah, um... I was just looking. I hope this still works because I went into a file here. I hope it means that I didn't screw up this tape now that I'm not on it. That's possible. Anyway, I was just looking for this quote. You know, I think it was up on your blog where you had this, these quotes of – no, actually it wasn't. Let's give credit to, I think, Michael Crowley of the Plank. Michael Crowley, yeah, at, who, at who, who published these quotes of Jane Harmon's at the time saying, we know they have WMD. We know they're close with al-Qaeda. There's no question about it. And that's just pure incompetence, you know, because it was obvious to me. I didn't know whether that had WMD, but I knew that we didn't know. I knew that there was a lot of questions about it. I knew that the statements that they were making were just not, you know, about how sure they were, were not credible. And if she was on the Intelligence Committee, she damn well should have known it. And yet I, I found some quote, I think, of Nora O'Donnell somewhere saying that, what, you know, I think last Sunday maybe, what are they so upset about? Well, she's too moderate. She's too credible. She's, she's, she's all these things that are the opposite of liberal, in their view. Right. Um, too centrist, that's what she says. Centrist, credible, and moderate. And what does it mean to be moderate and credible in, our, in the context of our political discourse? It means to be 100% wrong about Iraq and to be unapologetic. No, right. And so, I mean, so at the same time, I mean, you have the, 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 the Blue Dog con- Caucus in Congress was pushing very hard for Harmon, um, presumably because, you know, they're, they're moderates, and so it's important to them to have a, a fellow moderate not, not be removed from, from, from these positions. But, I mean, it, it, I, I mean, it, it really shows, I, I think, the, the, okay. the bankruptcy the of the so self-described get- moderate to, yeah, take I don't want to be right, because I, I actually attributed to Northern It was Andrea Mitchell. Harmon was too Andrea moderate, Mitchell. too centrist, even though she is the most credible Democrat on all of these issues. She said that uh, after the election. Uh, and right. then here's the quote that I lifted from Michael Crowley. There's a strong intelligence case that Iraq has not destroyed its weapons of mass destruction and is building the capacity to use them. There is growing al-Qaeda presence in Iraq, and I think the case can be made there is growing affiliation between Baghdad groups and terrorist groups. Well, it's a slightly, it's not as overstated as the way Rumsfeld and Cheney made it. Sure. But it's wrong. It's completely wrong, and that's the job she's being asked to do. You know, this was driving me nuts during the whole Lieberman-Lamont thing. What, what has Joe Lieberman accomplished? He was 100% wrong about the war and has stayed wrong about the war. And what's his other major accomplishment? Well, he's the guy who's in charge, who is, whose brilliant idea was to create this horrific Department of Homeland Security that's been a catastrophe in every way you look at it. And his other major accomplishment is to water down that uh, the update of the Glass-Steagall Act that they passed after um, all the security, uh, uh, you know, after the Enron thing. He's just a bad senator. Agree with him or not. Think he's the most annoying, sanctimonious prick on earth or not. He's just a bad, he's, he's not competent at his job. And yet again, this issue of competence is, is not, it's not on the table. What's on the table, the only issue that's on the table, is which side are you on? So, so Lieberman 
And McCain, and you've made this point, we're not telling anybody anything they don't know, except maybe she's still in this context. Lieberman and, and McCain are, quote-unquote, moderates. They're way right. outside the consensus on Iraq, okay? There's seven, they have, they're probably fewer than 20% of Americans agree with their hardline uh, hawkish position, even more hawkish than Bush, on Iraq. But they are moderates because that's the team they're on. And so the Note loves them, the New Republic loves them this week, with George Stephanopoulos loves them, and it doesn't matter a damn bit that everything they say turns out to be totally wrong. No, on, 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 on the subject of, uh, of, of McCain, I, sh I should plug from, from over the weekend uh, Matt Welch's uh, op-ed in, in the L.A. Times about him, where, where he did the... Uh, he, he took what's really the revolutionary step of saying that what he was going to do was try and look at what it is John McCain had done um, as a senator and, and see what his views are on questions. And, you know, you come up, come up with the view that he um, likes all kinds of uh, uh, different sorts of regulations. He wants to ban a lot of stuff. And he, um, he really likes war. You know, um, him and, and, and Lieberman, uh, you, you know, far from, from moderate on, on foreign policy questions, are probably the, the two single most, you know, militaristic uh, uh, senators out yeah. there, um, but sure. I mean, it gets counted as a as a moderate position because I mean, on the one hand, I mean, they both do have a, a handful of, of, of views that are that, that, that are genuinely modern, but moderate rather. But you know, mostly it's a kind of um, social affiliation almost. Yeah, you no, know, it, there's, a, exactly there's, there's a moderate. The longer you live in Washington, the more you see that it's a social. Affiliation. That's what. That's why Robert Novak is still in the business that he's in, because he's, he's a member of the club. You know, when I, uh, during the 2000 election, I wrote a nation column when all the journalists were slobbering over McCain, and I said, you know, I didn't, I didn't go on the, on the campaign bus at all. I didn't leave my house, really. But I just said, just look at what the guy stands for. What are you talking about, you know? You guys are nuts. And, and these journalists would call me up and scream at me because they think that I had insulted them by saying they had fallen head over heels for McCain. And I would say, dude, do you agree with this? Do you agree with this? Do you agree with this? Well, no, but that's not important. Jake Weisberg actually wrote a column. Jake Weisberg and Mark Halper and I use for, like, metaphors as this quote-unquote smart conventional wisdom. But Jake Weisberg wrote a column in Slate where he said, literally, ignore the things that McCain says. That's not what's important. He's just... Sure, well, I mean, he, he, he looked into his eyes and saw that... that right, he, he saw that he was a right. good... Looked into his heart and saw that he was a good man. Right. And, uh, yes. and, and that's really what they've done. The, the, you know, McCain's ex-press secretary is now the press secretary for the note. You know? Is he? I'm like, how can she tell the difference? It's like, well, uh, it's, you know, it's like when certain journalists go to work for the White House and you think they were always working for the White House. But, uh, but right, sure. there's just this club, and you're in it or you're out of it. And, and the thing is, if you're in it, you're in it at the cost of your intellectual integrity. And once you're willing to part with your intellectual integrity, Washington can be a very pleasant place. <laughs> well, see, I'm, I'm working on that. Yeah. Right? You know, well, you're young, man. You've got time. You've got, more, trying, you got more wars to support. Uh-huh. Yes, yes. I mean, that, 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 that would be my hope. Um, yeah, you know, and I, I, I should say, I'm, I mean, you know, sometimes I think when, when people... Uh, uh, get, 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 get to talking about this stuff, you know, it, it can sound like it's nothing but, um, uh, y y you know, bitterness. That y you know, you want to see uh, whatever, pe pe people who are wrong suffer. I, this goes back to, I, I guess, what, what, what you were saying before, but, y y you know, asking people what, what, what they've learned from this. And, and to me, that th that's the, the underappreciated um, question here, is, is that a lot of people, y even some people I see um, who, who will say they were wrong, about Iraq don't seem to have actually taken anything o away from that, changed their sort of, you know, uh, approach to, to, to the world or to, to, to how they think about things. Um, and, you know, and so you see this uh, talk constantly swirling around about Iran, about Syria, about this and that, uh, everywhere, and it seems like the, the country as a whole has learned o almost nothing. That uh, We've learned maybe that our army right now is in Iraq so that it's not particularly practical to try and conquer Syria tomorrow. Um, but nothing about the, about the, the, the mindset and the, 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 the approach to the world that uh, created this kind of situation. And, and I think it's, it's genuinely um, frightening to me uh, the, the extent to which 
For example, starting the day after the election, I heard people, you know, again, centrist, moderate Democrats, who were talking about how, well, their worry was that this was going to be like after Vietnam, where there was a, an overreaction to the, to, to the disaster. Um, and, and as far as I can tell, there, there hasn't been any reaction at all yet. Yeah, this is a topic that I've spent a lot of time on in my life, and I, 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 it's, it's worthy of a book. I mean, I, there's a relatively new book by Stephen Kinzer called Overthrow, which right. is, Stephen Kinzer is a journalist who does history, and he's not really a he's not really a historian in the sense that if you are a historian already, you don't learn anything from what he writes. But he does pull together mm -hmm. a synthetic uh, argument uh, that's, that's wider than what most historians would do. And he looks at every single U.S. military intervention, significant one, since we invaded Hawaii, which I forget when that was, under Grover Cleveland. And almost without exception, they've been catastrophes. I mean, World War right. I was not a catastrophe. World War II was certainly necessary. But most of them, you can, I suppose, argue about Korea, but most of them have just been horrible, both from the standpoint of the people there and our own standpoint. And to me, I think, I wrote a book about democracy and foreign policy called Who Speaks for America that nobody read. I think there are good okay. reasons for that. I think that our political culture is particularly ill-suited to intervening in other political cultures. I think we're an incredibly, you know, uh, the, 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 the things that motivate our politics are not useful in terms of making decisions about other cultures. We're incredibly insulated people who not very sophisticated about the world, not much experience with it. Uh, we, don't, we don't really respect difference very much. We think everybody should just, you know, have a Walmart in their neighborhood and so forth. And, and we go and we, these other countries, and we expect them to behave just like us. And, you know, Bush has said that his policy is based on the fact that he believes in God, and God has imbued every human being with the yearning for freedom, and therefore we're going to go and give the world freedom. Well, Bush's idea of freedom and other people's idea of freedom is quite different, and he doesn't seem to have any clue about that. But in any case, if you look at Kinzer's book, he's got like 14 or 28 chapters, or I don't remember how many, and they're all catastrophes. And, you know, when right. I... When well, and also, I, I mean, I... I yeah, you know, Kinzer's book... It, it's just for, 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 for the audience. I mean, it's, it's not just about, about every military intervention, but it's specifically about the practice of, of regime change, yeah, right? right, you're right. I'm sorry. Going someplace and saying, no, we're going to put a different, better government in, into place. And, and what, what he, he shows pretty convincingly, I mean, not, not only that the, the, the resulting government has, you know, pretty much never actually been better from a, from a humanitarian point of view, um, but that it's... Very hard to even find a case where, where, where the narrow goals of, of the policy have actually yeah. been See, that's achieved. One, that was one reason why I was unalterably opposed to this war, because I, I thought that we were bad at this kind of thing. But if you, look, if you look at how difficult it would have been, even if we were good at this kind of thing, I mean, if you look at the history of this region and all of the different hatreds that have been bottled up under this dictatorship, and how little they had in common, and how much, you know, how, how all the complexities of that situation. And then you looked at who the Bush administration was. Who are these people that think they can do that? You know, the first thing these idiots did was send over Heritage Foundation interns to run the place. Um, sure. Ma Michael Ledeen's daughter, you know, was like in charge of something important. Um, and I said to my friends, even if you think it's the absolute right thing to do, even if you think we're the people to do it, how in the world can you trust these crazy people to pull it off? Look how difficult it would be. And, and, everyone, and that's kind of an un-American thing to say. To say out loud, do you think that this nation is, is not capable of achieving anything at all? That's a can't-do attitude. That's un-American. How dare you even bring that up? So the entire discussion of the invasion of Iraq three years ago, took or four years ago, took place as if it was, is it right or is it wrong? But it would be the easiest thing in the world to do to turn this place into, you know, Daytona Beach tomorrow. When, in fact, there were right. a million things that could, could have gone wrong and have gone wrong, and a lot of things we couldn't have even predicted that have gone wrong. And, and so to my friends like you, Matt, I say, how in the world, given, given what a complex endeavor this was undoubtedly going to be, how in the world could you have trusted these lunatics to have done it? And, and I, 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 don't, I, don't, I see very little excuse for that. I have very, it's hard for me to say this because so many people supported it and some of them are my friends, but it's, it's very hard for me to retain my intellectual respect 
for people who supported this war unless they're able to come out and say, here's where I made my mistake, here's what I've learned, and here's why I'm going to go on. One reason, for instance, you wanted to talk about George Packer. I'm sh George's book is very good, but I don't trust George's judgment at all because George hasn't been able to explain why he got this so wrong. All he's able to say is, oh, well, they, they were incompetent in how they pulled it off. But everybody knew how incompetent they were when they started. That's who you were giving this invasion to. It was given to a group of incompetent people. So all these smart guys like Jake Weisberg and George Packer and all, all these liberal hawks, they should have known better, and there's no excuse for it, unless they can explain exactly you know, how it is that they got wrong. Now, a lot of people, I guess, were influenced by Ken Pollock, and Ken Pollock sure. just got this the nature of the threat wrong. He just said, we have to do this right away, it's a catastrophe. Even if it goes badly, we still got to do it. I suppose that's an argument. You'd have to say why in the world Ken Pollock is God. And, you know, I, at that point, I didn't, I hadn't read his book, so maybe if I had read it, I might have been a hawk. But I, I sure. just don't know why uh, in the world. mystifying powers. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I, what, what, what I wanted to say, though, about, about, about George, George Packer was that he, he has an article in um, the, the, the latest New Republic, which is a whole big rock symposium. Um, and, I, and I found, you know, his writing as it's evolved on, on Iraq uh, and the New Republic's writing on, on this subject as well over the past couple of years to, to, to be so annoying that when, when I read his article... My overwhelming reaction was, was to just be annoyed with it. And it, it, it took me uh, <coughs> a couple deep breaths, several days, reading some, some blog posts, of what, one by, by, by Jim Henley, to, to recognize that, it, it's, as annoyed as I might be about this general view on, on, on Iraq, um, the, the article is, uh, is, is pretty good, and it is, is making the point that... Um, it, you know, obviously, whether the Bush administration wants to admit it or not, uh, what we're doing there is, is doomed. We're going to need to pack up and, and leave at some point. And if, if we do that, we're going to be leaving behind, you know, a, a lot of people who worked with, with the American government, who, who worked with the, the American military in, in some respect. Um, and unless we can come up with, with something, um, some way to help them out, they're, they're all going to be killed. Um, you know, which um, seems bad. Um, and and what, what, what Packer advocates is just, he, he gets, I think, sloppy about this and just sort of says, well, you know, we should make, make the visa requirements easier. Uh, but, but, I mean, obviously the problem is is that w we've created a country which is, you know, full of, of terrorists and, and killers and, and so forth. Um, you know, and so w we have good reason for wanting to try and be stingy about, about bringing people... Iraqi refugees over here, but at the same time, I mean, we do seem to me to have a, a, a real moral responsibility to try and uh, take take people in insofar as possible. Yeah, well, there's any number of of like I said, this is this is the worst thing that the, our government has ever done voluntarily. It's much worse than Vietnam, except for the fact that a lot fewer people are being killed, uh, which is not nothing. You know, Vietnam, in Vietnam, uh, probably uh, at least 2 million people were killed uh, in Indochina, and of course, 57,000 Americans were killed. But the problems that this invasion has created are much more complicated, they were much more difficult, and the, the, the net uh, negative impact of it is far worse in Vietnam in terms of all of the death and destruction that will result thereafter once it's over. All the terrorists we've created, all the instability we've created in the system, uh, and, and the that effects. Now, this is a rather small one. There are a few thousand people who will be vulnerable and maybe killed if we take them there, or we'll have to figure out a way to do an airlift of lots of refugees here. Uh, that's relatively small compared to the other catastrophes that this has caused, but there it is. Now, there are no good options here, and the natural human uh, response to no good options is to do nothing. You know, and that's, right. that's what I think is going to happen for a long time, just we're going to have a, the slow, relentless grinding, which is a kind of mass murder, you know. We're just going to, we're going to go on for a few years until we can't help it anymore, and then we're going to get out in the most ignominious way possible, and nothing good will happen. So I guess I agree that we need to plan for a, uh, uh, a withdrawal now. I hadn't really been able to make up my mind because I do think it will be a terrible situation. But I do think we need to plan for withdrawal now and try to contain the situation and to the degree that 
we can protect some of these people and bring them over fine. But that just can't be the point. The point is we have to get out because every day we're there, we make it worse. If you saw these polls that were published, I mean, the vast majority of Iraqis want us out now. I think most of them now are supporting the insurgents, attacks on U.S. forces. You know, which is horrific right. because these are... Well, and I mean, I mean, this is what's, what, what, what's so terrible about, about the policy of, of, of denial is that if you keep staying until the point where it's literally not feasible logistically to, to, to maintain the, the, the people there, then you need to leave, you know, in an absolute panic in a way that gives you no ability to, to, to contain the fallout of, of, of what's happening. Um, and, and already you're seeing paralysis. I mean, there's been this uh, situation in, in Lebanon, which is, you know, related to... to things that, that have happened there, but also to what's happening in Iraq, has been playing out slowly for months and more quickly since since the Gamal was, was, was assassinated. And, and as best I can tell, you know, we're not doing anything related to that. Um, which, you know, maybe it's good, because maybe anything the Bush administration tried to do would be would be <laughs> just, just even worse. But, you know, it's as if the, 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 the administration, the country, is just sort of Paralyzed by, by, by denial and, you know, isn't ready to try and cope with, with what's happening. Well, yeah, because the country is, hasn't been prepared for how awful things are there. I mean, you know, in the first Gulf War, the United States uh, radio, the USIA radio, called on the Kurds to, and the southern Shiites to rebel against Saddam Hussein. And when they did, they were mowed down by the returning Republican Guard. And we let it happen, and we just... You know, we what we ended up doing was inciting their own suicide, and that's actually one reason why the neocons have been so moralistic about this war. And if you listen to Christopher Hitchens, you know he's always bringing this up, and that's why we owe it to these people. But in fact, all we turned out to be not we, because I didn't have a damn thing to do with it, but all the Bush administration and supporters have turned out to do, been able to do, is make this thing a million times worse. So just by saying. All they're doing now is po postponing the Day of Reckoning. And there are very few voices in the public discourse that, again, this is one more failure of nerve on the part of our establishment. There's very few voices in the public discourse who are willing to call them on it, to say, look, it's going to happen. Let's deal with it now. Now, I suppose you could give Packer credit for that if you want, although I'd like to see him take some responsibility for getting us in there in the first place. But, sure. but I would still like to, I would still want to know what exactly you have in mind. I mean, this is the, I mean, as you, I think you've said it, and I think Duncan Black has said it over and over, George Bush is not going to leave Iraq. In order for George Bush to leave Iraq, he would have to admit that he had been wrong, that he had failed. He's not going to do that. He would rather have thousands of Iraqis die every week and hundreds of Americans die every week than admit that he made a fundamental mistake. And, the, okay, he's a son of a bitch. He deserves to be impeached and maybe tried. You know, that's not going to happen. Um, but... Where is the establishment? Where are the people, where is the permanent governing class, the people who we've always depended on to keep, uh, you know, our leadership on an even keel? Why are they going for that? If Jim Baker, if Jim Baker's, uh, if his uh, mandate, as he understands it, is not to propose anything that this incredibly uh, incompetent, and dishonest, and extremist president won't reject outright, well, then that's not, that's, that's, just a, that's just a rubber stamp. That's not providing the quote-unquote wise man role that, that, that he's being praised for. I mean, Clark Clifford, when, when Lyndon Johnson put together his wise man panel, and Clark Clifford said, you've got to get out. It's over. We've lost. Right. And, and that's when the Vietnam War ended, that, when the wise men made their presentation on Lyndon Johnson. Uh, but, but Baker... Wait, the Vietnam War didn't end when the wise men gave their presentation. No, it did. It took a long time for it to end. But that's, well, okay. I, I, but that's when, it, that's when people stopped talking about winning and started talking about how do we get out. Leaving, sure. Yeah. And, uh, and everyone sort of agreed that that was the goal, and we had to do it in mm -hmm. a different way. You know, people argued about what was the cost of getting out in different ways. But it seems, from what I read about Baker, he's, he's, he's insisting on providing something that will fly with the administration. Well, George Bush has already defined reality off the table. So, no, sure. I mean, you can't give good advice that's going to be accepted by crazy people. I mean, it's yeah, just so, impossible. So, so, again, I'm just, you know, this is, we have a crappy political system in this country because it doesn't, it doesn't provide a fundamental ballast. Right. Well, 
I think with those happy thoughts, uh, I, I, sh I should actually uh, um, bring, bring this to an end. Okay. But, uh, yes, political system, screwed up. Okay, deal. We agree? All right. Okay, see ya. Well, <laughs> cool. Bye. Bye.